public defender is an attorney employed by the community and responsible for giving legal aid without cost to any person who seeks it and is financially unable to employ private counsel. It is his duty to defend those accused of crime until the issue is decided in the court of law. The first public defender's office in the United States was opened in January 1913. Over the years, other offices were opened. And today, that handful has grown to a network. A network of lawyers cooperating to protect the rights of our clients. Now, in the entire history of the public defender's office, one case stands out as perhaps the most difficult we've ever tried. It involved arson, murder, and insanity, and eventually took me all the way to the state Supreme Court. Mr. Pike? Yes, sir? I'm Deputy District Attorney Hornsby. Won't you come in, please? Sit down. This is Mr. Berger of the Amiga Insurance Company. Three weeks ago, your aunt, Miss Rosetta Pike, 1419 West 5th Place, perished in a fire which destroyed her residence. You're claiming the insurance? I'm her only relative. You also claim the insurance on a necklace of your aunt's. It was lost in the fire. Wasn't it? It's in a safe deposit box at the Merchant's Bank. If you knew it was there, Mr. Pike, you'd be guilty of fraud. But I didn't know. Honest, I thought it was burned. You're lying. It's been in the vault for three years. I've been out of town. In that case, there can be no fraud. However, Mr. Burgess seems to have some doubts. About the fire, too. The fire? It was an accident, wasn't it? Was it? We also carried the insurance on your aunt's life. I know. $7,000 worth. Mr. Hornsby, I, I didn't start the fire. The arson detail found traces of candles. Somebody burned that house down, Pike. Got any ideas? I wish you wouldn't say that, mister. He's not accusing you, Mr. Pike. All I know is somebody lit the match. And I'm going to find out who. Oh, what's the use? I did it. Did what? Burned down the house. Miss Rogers, bring your book, please. I warn you, anything you say may be used against you. March 24th, Office Deputy District Attorney Mark Hornsby. Present, Mr. John Berger, Amiga Insurance Company, Clifford Pike, myself. Uh, you live at 1367 West Vermont Street? You understand any statement you make is free and voluntary without any promise of immunity or reward. You're making this confession because you wish to get it off your conscience? No. Tell us how you set fire to your aunt's house. I lit a candle and put it in the closet on the second floor. Which closet? I don't remember. Was it your intention to kill your aunt? Yes, sir. You're saying this because it is the truth? Yes, sir. confession, it'll be necessary to hold you. You'll be booked in the county jail. Do you have an attorney? I got no money until the insurance. We're not paying off yet. The court will appoint a public defender. Your grandmother died three months ago. Kind of coincidental, wasn't it? No, sir, that wasn't a coincidence. I poisoned her. How? With arsenic. Isn't that what they all use?
two weeks after the indictment, I was appointed to represent Clifford Pike. The charge, suspicion of murder, arson, and grand theft. Yeah, I said that. And is this your signature? Uh, the district attorney says that you did it for the insurance money. No, sir. The voices made me do it. The voices? I didn't want to, Mr. Matthews, but... The voices, they, they wouldn't leave me alone. They made me do it. Mr. Matthews, you do me a favor. The jailer has $40 of mine. Will you get it and, and buy the boys some cigarettes and candy? There's some awful nice fellas in there. Some of them don't have a dime. I'll talk to the sergeant. Makes me feel bad to see what those voices can do to other people. Mr. Pike, were you ever in an institution of any kind? I'm not crazy, Mr. Matthews. You mustn't think that. I'm sorry. Were you ever in the Army? Yes, sir. For how long? Three months. I was discharged on a Section 2. Emotionally unstable. And what did you do before you joined the transit company? <laughs> Knocked her out. Bus boy, hotel clerk, done a million things. Once I worked in a nursery. I love flowers. Driving that streetcar was the worst. People are mean to you. There's rails. They make noises. Sometimes they sing. Autos cut in front. You, you can't turn. You got to go right where the rails take you. I dream every night of taking a car down the street without rails. Someday I'll do it. Could have happened like he says, Mr. Matthews. But you still list its origin as unknown or undetermined. Until someone's convicted. Well, is there any other way it could have started? The old wiring, those old gas stoves. Oh, but you found candles and the debris. Well, we found traces. Now, Sergeant, you've been ahead of this detail for quite a while. What's your experience with people who start fires? Well, how do you mean? Their personalities. Well, firebugs usually have one thing in common. What's that? They're crazy. Everyone I talked to about Pike called him a strange little man. I requested the court to appoint a psychiatrist to examine him. Dr. Miller had long experience with the mentally ill. These voices that you hear, Mr. Pike, where do they come from? From everywhere. Oh, there's ceiling, airplanes, radiators. What did they tell you? They killed my grandmother and my aunt. And you've heard these voices since you left school? Since I was 15. That's why I quit school. Didn't you ever go to a doctor? I was ashamed. Did you tell your parents? My father died when I was a little. My mother five years ago. Did you like your mother? <sighs> Everybody likes their mother. You say you loved your grandmother and your aunt. Why did you kill them? Voices told me to. Doctor, they were driving me crazy. After you killed your aunt, did the voices stop? No. Now they're cursing me. They say I'm no good. I didn't want to do it, Doctor. The voices made me. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Pike. Come in, Bart. What do you think? An obvious case of schizophrenia with a very strong guilt complex. What caused it? His father was a promising musician. His grandmother and his aunt expected him to be like his father. Instead, he was erratic, unreliable, a drifter. They constantly criticized him for his failure. Yet he says that he liked them. Sure, because he feels guilty for hating them. Uh, what about his parents? Both dead. I gathered that his mother must have been dominated by the grandmother, who was a strict disciplinarian. Well, when he comes up for plea tomorrow, I'll enter an additional plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. How do you feel? In my professional opinion, he's insane. The 
case of the people versus Clifford Pike went to trial in Superior Court on May 15th before Judge Homer Edwards. We elected to waive a jury trial. Dr. Anthony B. Collins, autopsy surgeon for the county coroner, established the cause of death of Miss Rosetta Pike, asphyxia from inhalation of smoke. Insurance investigator Berger told the court that Clifford Pike stood to inherit $15,000 in life and fire insurance upon his aunt's death. Deputy District Attorney Hornsby needed only a few witnesses to establish the contention of the state that Clifford Pike was guilty. He then rested his case. Having no witnesses to dispute the facts introduced and basing my hopes on the insanity trial to follow, I rested my case. It is the verdict of the court that the defendant, Clifford Pike, is found guilty as charged. We will take up the sanity issue tomorrow. Court will recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Seems like a real nice fella. What's this about tomorrow? Am I going to be tried again? Well, the psychiatrists who have been examining you will testify tomorrow as to your sanity. Well, Mr. Matthews, I'm not crazy. I I'm as sane as you are. For your sake, I hope you're not. Your name, please. Dr. Alfred Hughes. And what is your official position, doctor? I'm chief psychiatrist of the state hospital for the criminally insane. You examined the defendant? I did. Will you tell the court the results of your examination? I found Mr. Pike above normal intelligence, very clever and well-versed in the uh, deeper significance of psychology. Have you formed any opinion as to whether or not he's schizophrenic? Yes, I have. It's my opinion that he's faking. And on what do you base that opinion, Doctor? A number of things. Primarily a series of tests, especially the Rorschach test. His reactions were definitely within normal limits. Did you find any further clue that would tend to make you think the defendant is faking? Yes. Uh, in his home, I found many books on abnormal psychology. Careful pencil marks have been made opposite references to hallucinations and the voices he claims he hears. Hmm. Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> Your witness. Dr. Hughes. Do you uh, know of any people mentally ill that read books about their illness? Yes. Well, aren't most schizophrenics intellectually aware of their problem? Many are. Are these marks that you mentioned, couldn't the defendant have made the marks because they illustrate his problem? In my opinion, he's simulating schizophrenia. Would you mind answering my question, doctor? I'll repeat it again. Could he have made the marks because they illustrate his problem? Well, yes. Thank you. But that'll be all, Doctor. You may step down. The prosecution then rested their case. I called as my first witness, Dr. Miller. He stated the defendant was suffering from auditory hallucinations and delusions of persecution. He told of Pike's treatment at the hands of his grandmother and aunt, which caused his emotional instability. The prosecution did not cross-examine. My next witness was James Baldwin. I'm a dispatcher on the day shift at the transit company. You know the defendant, Mr. Baldwin? Sure I do. Been a motorman for five months. Seen him every day nearly till he got fired. Well, you tell the court in your own words why he was discharged. Yeah. He went off his rocker. I object, Your Honor. The witness is not qualified to pass on the defendant's sanity. Objection sustained. Exactly what happened. Well, he was near the end of his run, see? 10, 12 blocks away, with a loaded car. All of a sudden, no stops. Go on. Well, he went past 10 stops with the people yelling to get off. If you ask me, he's bats. Your Honor, I must ask. Strike the last sentence. Your witness. Mr. Baldwin, when did this event occur? Wednesday, March 22nd. March 22nd, are you sure? He was fired the same day. Transit company don't let bums like him drive streetcars. Your Honor, I'm assassinated. Strike everything after day. Your Honor, I should like to place in evidence People's Exhibit Number 14, a carbon copy of a letter I sent to Mr. Pike on March 20th, asking him to come to my office March 24th. 
On March 22nd, the day after he received this, he committed the act of joyriding in his streetcar. I submit to the court that this studied act of lunacy was the beginning of a clever plan to pretend insanity. And fool his attorney and the doctors who examined him. I object, Your Honor. The letter is irrelevant and immaterial and has no bearing on the sanity of the defendant. Objection overruled. It is the finding of this court that the defendant was sane at the time of commission of the offense and is sane now. I'll put this matter over to the 28th for sentencing. No. No, you can't let him do that. He made a mistake. I'm crazy. Having been found sane, Clifford Pike was sentenced to die within 90 days. I went to visit him in the death house at the state prison. They got no right to kill me. I'm not responsible. I'm insane. I appealed to the state Supreme Court, but they turned us down. Why can't they understand? The voices made me do it. Mr. Matthews, get me another psychiatrist. Wouldn't do any good. And go to the governor. I'd like to, but I need to present extenuating circumstances. Now, isn't there anyone you knew as a boy who could testify on your behalf? The neighborhood's full of new people. Well, can't you remember who lived next door to you when you were a boy? When they died, the new owners made a rooming house out of it. It's no use. There's nobody. Don't waste your time. Don't you worry about that. It's my job to find someone. I was puzzled. My client's life was at stake, and yet he refused to cooperate. With the help of an old city directory, I located a former neighbor of the Pikes without too much trouble. Yes, sir? Hello, I'm Bart Matthews, public defender's office. Oh, yes, I read your name in the paper. You're Clifford's lawyer. Come in. I've been following the case very closely. You don't know how upset I've been. Is he going to die? Could you tell me something about his childhood, Mrs. King? Oh, such a nice boy. Would you like some cocoa? No, thanks. His poor mother. I hope she doesn't hear about it. His mother? She's dead. Dead? Did he say that? My land sakes alive, he must be crazy. She's in Canada, left about a week after the fire. How do you know? Oh, Annette's been visiting me from time to time for five years now. Ever since I moved here. I guess I'm about her only friend. Why, she was here the day before she left. She was so happy. Of course, she didn't know that Clifford... Why should she be so happy? She was free, like a bird escaped from a cage. I'm not one to gossip, Mr. Matthews, but that old Mrs. Pike and her daughter made life miserable for poor Annette. They treated her like dirt. Well, do you know of any reason why Clifford should lie about his mother and say that she was dead? No, he loved her in his way. I'm sure of that. Where can I reach her? She's near Quebec. She's French-Canadian, you know. Oh, I had a lovely card from her a few weeks ago. I always save my prettiest postcards. This one is of a lake. Lake, uh, St. Raymond. May I have it? Well, if it'll do you any good. I'm sure that it will, Mrs. King. Are uh, you haven't written about the case. How could I tell her that Clifford's going to die? I see what you mean. Got a new psychiatrist? No. How can I believe anything you say, Pike? Why did you tell me your mother was dead? She is. She's in Canada. She went there a week after the fire. Mr. Matthews, she's got a bad heart. If she learns about this, it'll kill her. Pike, she's on her way here now. You lie. Nobody knows where she is. She was located at St. Raymond, Quebec. My mother's not on trial. I am. You can't bring her into this. Her evidence might get us a new trial. I don't want a new trial. Get out. I don't need you. I don't need anybody. And leave my mother alone. Leave my mother alone. Leave her alone. Do you think you could get a new trial? Mr. Matthew? If you could help me find some new evidence. If it is a strange boy, but it's not his fault. Mr. Matthew, can you understand what it means to raise a boy in a house of hate? I married his father in Canada. 
during the First World War, when he brought me home, his mother and sister were furious. His father died a year after Clifford was born. You were forced to live with him? Thirty-five years. And Clifford hated his aunt and grandmother? He never forgave them for their treatment of me. I wanted more than anything in life to get away from that house, to go home again. You hated them that much? I didn't kill them, Mr. Matthew. But I must confess that deep in my heart, I wished them dead. Oh, I would never do anything like that. I, I want to see Clifford, Mr. Matthew, to tell him that I understand. I'll contact the warden and arrange a visit for you. Thank you. Please tell them not to be too angry with Clifford. He's had a very unhappy life. you think he can get you a new trial if I testify? I won't let you. Please, Clifford. Mother, you know why I got you out of the country so fast. Now leave before they discover. Discover? Discover what? What are you talking about? Mother, let me do this for you. I've never been a, a good son, but I'll, I'll get off. Don't you worry about me. I've never been a good son to you. I ran away, left you to stay with them. I wanted to get you out of there, but I couldn't. Now that you're free, go on back to Canada. I don't want anything to happen to you. Clifford, you think I did it. Mr. Matthew, he think I did it. Please, Mother, stop it. Oh, I, I didn't poison your grandmother, Clifford. I saw that poison in the kitchen closet. Oh, that was for the garden and the mice. The doctor said it was her heart. But the night of the fire, when we started for the movies, you went back for something. I saw the light go on in the upstairs hall. It was for my purse, Clifford, for my purse. When we came home, the house was burned almost to the ground. You wouldn't go close. We stayed a block away. You had a strange look on your face. You were happy. I was glad it happened. But I didn't make it happen. You must believe me. Then, if you didn't do it, must have been an accident. I didn't do it. Wait. It was cold that night. Rosetta used to turn on all those old gas heaters when she was chilly. I warned her to get them fixed, but she wouldn't spend the money. It had to be an accident, Clifford. It had to be. Mr. Matthew. Mr. Matthew, you've got to get me out of here. I, I didn't do it. Neither did my mother. It was an accident. <laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> Ever hear anything so crazy? <laughs> With my client in the death house, I was able to get the state Supreme Court to listen to my appeal within two weeks. I presented my new evidence. I had had the body of Pike's grandmother exhumed. The autopsy report showed no trace of poison. The state Supreme Court ordered a new trial for Clifford Pike. It was proven that no murders had been committed and that the fire was accidental. He was exonerated and able to claim his legal inheritance. The case you have just seen was brought to a fair and just conclusion through the efforts of a public defender. Tonight, Revlon salutes public defender Thomas W. Vinson, Will County, Joliet, Illinois, and his staff for outstanding achievement in the cause of justice.